that's, that's where the issue is. Because out of boredom, people get hungry. Eliza? Um, yeah, at first I would definitely um, agree with Dorothy on the flying in the same direction because I think that that's, that's huge. Um, for us in our program, I think one of the things that's made some of our collaborations successful is really everyone at the table had the ability to kind of see beyond their organization and what they do. And um, for example, for us at the health department, we looked at the problem of obesity and we started to think about all of these other influences out there in the world and we brought in partners <coughs> outside of our traditional kind of health related setting. So right now we have a project that's going on, it's called Healthy Places by Design. It's really um, totally based in partnerships, it's a, a huge partnership with the Greater Providence YMCA and that's probably the closest thing we have to a, a health-related partnership. That one was pretty obvious. The other partners at the table are um, Department of Administration statewide planning program. And those are the folks who train or who work with community planners. Community planners are the folks who are really, you know, helping cities and towns make decisions about where schools should be placed, should a sidewalk be put on that street when they rip it up. Um, do we need to paint a bike lane on that or not? Do we want to have an enterprise zone where um, Shopping is not taxed. So those kinds of things. Other people at the table at Grow Smart Rhode Island, there are a coalition of smart growth advocates, um, Department of Transportation. So we really had to kind of think about this problem as more than just physical activity and nutrition in a healthcare setting or a, a health-related setting and kind of expand it out there. And um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's definitely not something, the first time I think the first time we sat down at the table with statewide planning, we had a conversation, we all felt really good about it, and then I remember going back and, and kind of reporting back to my staff about what happened, and I said, I have absolutely no idea what just happened at that table. I felt really good about it. They said a bunch of stuff I didn't understand. You know, we had to call them about 4,000 times to, to really understand what they were talking about. They called us 4,000 times to understand what we were talking about. Finally, we broke down and we hired somebody who's a municipal planner to work with us to kind of serve as a translator. So there were a lot of difficulties in that. But now I think, you know, we finally get, and it's only taken a year, we finally get to that place where we all understand what we're doing. We all have a role. And now when statewide planning is making decisions, they're thinking about the health impacts of things. So, it, you know, to be able to kind of see beyond that, it's definitely a challenge, but I think it's really helpful in our collaborations and being able to get things done. Great. Thank you. For me, the sustainability as a profession is a one-on-one -on -one in the exam room. Um, the relationship that I have the privilege of having with families and, and pediatricians and family physicians have that privilege is how do we make change within the individual unit that makes sense to this family, that is doable. Um, I can certainly give a family a growth chart and say, this year really stank, do better, we'll see you next year. <laughs> and, and that doesn't help anybody. I mean, that lowers self-esteem, which is certainly not a motivator because most of us deal with self-esteem with a bag of chips. Um, but <laughs> there are other ways to go about it. So I kind of go see, do you see this as a problem? If they don't see it as a problem, I should spend my energy elsewhere. I should work on that self-esteem so that someday that child realizes they want to be different. Um, if they do see it as a problem, what's the one thing that we can do right now to make a difference? Um, so they don't have a place. It's 4.30, it's dark, nobody's going outside to play, but boy, you can put on that music and you can have a dance party in your kitchen and you know how many calories vacuuming burns off? Mom would love it if you could help vacuum. Um, or cleaning up your room. You know, can you make a basketball hoop and throw your dirty laundry into that basketball hoop in your room? There are ways of getting kids to move that they don't realize. Or, the, the one I really love is I make kids earn their screen time. You cannot watch screen time until you have moved for 20 minutes and you set the egg timer, and you only earn as much screen time as you move. That really frosts them. Um, <laughs> there, there are lots of ways that, that we can be creative within the budget that we all have, um, and help kids to feel good about what they're doing, because none of us wants to do anything that someone else told us to do it. It has to be from the inside out. And so that's the job I feel pediatricians and family physicians have. Thank you. We want to get to some of your questions, but there is, I think, one more question I'm going to ask our panelists to tackle, um, because it's sort of the one that kind of stalls things out from time to time, and that's the funding question. 
Um, I'd like to start with Dorothy and Eliza and then invite Beth and, and Frank to join in the conversation. But I'd like them to talk to us about what role does funding play and what do they see as the best uses of public money. So, Eliza, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, funding plays a big issue, definitely plays a big issue. Um, I do think that it's, it's hard sometimes, I think, when you're in a situation to be able to see past the fact that maybe you don't have enough funding or the funding is ending or, you know, all of these things. But I think it's important to realize that there's never going to be enough money. Like we were talking about with the advertising budgets, there's, we're, I don't think that we're ever going to come to a place where we all say, well, we really have enough money to do everything we need to do to solve this problem. This is great. Um, but I think, you know, part of it is collaboration and, and starting to realize, you know, who has things that are going to help our effort, what things do we have that are going to help this other effort, trying to work together in that way. Um, I think there are a lot of things that you can do with limited funding that are still going to have a big impact. Might be a lot of work, but maybe not a lot of funding. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now at the state is we're trying to change the food contracts within the city. And for us, that's really not costing us anything except for staff time. You know, probably on the other end, if food actually changes there, there's going to be some costs to the, the, the people, the food service providers, possibly. But the changes that we're making are things like, can we change the wording in the RFP that goes out so that, you know, whoever wants to provide foods in our cafeteria have to um, stick to some nutritional guidelines or something like that. That's a change that's so actually, you know, once it's in place, it took our staff time, it took a lot of work, Hopefully it's going to be sustained, it's not going to take a ton.